You're listening to episode 49 of the Confident Writer Podcast with Jane Pike. Team, I am so thrilled to be able to share this conversation with Jim Masterson today. Just a heads up, the audio is a little sketchy in parts. The internet connection wasn't being our friend on this particular occasion, but there is so much good stuff in here. It is well worth riding out the waves. Let's get into it now. I am super excited right now to be sitting here, well, face to face with Jim Masterson of the Masterson Method. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jim. You're welcome. So I myself am really familiar with your methods and practices and have used them to great effect in my own horsing life. But before we get into the details of um, the questions that I have, would you like to give us a some background information about what the Masterson Method is? Sure. So it's a method of, well, when early on when I started doing this, I was, I was working on hunter jumpers at the show, on the show circuit. And so I wasn't really expecting to teach it, but, but I had to come up with a short explanation of what it was because it isn't really massage. It isn't really chiropractic. It isn't, it's kind of a, it's kind of an integrated form of body work. So I had to come up with what my wife calls the 15 second elevator speech. So yeah. Yeah with somebody and they're trapped in the elevator with you how would you describe it so it's a a method of equine body work where we learn to read and follow the responses of the horse to our touch to help it release tension in key junctions of the body that most affect performance so Mm -hmm. i said originally i was working on on uh, performance horses so that was my that was my goal that's what i wanted to do so but the focus started to shift as people would see the body work being then horse owners would want to start to learn it because it's uh, very interactive with the horse and it's um, and it's it's teachable. You know, you don't start with a lot of anatomy. It's you start with learning how to read the horse and and the and the different levels of pressure and a few basic techniques. And from there, you know, anybody can learn how to do it. So that's, that would that was the 15 second elevator elevator speech that got me into a barn. You know, to work on somebody's show horse. Mm-hmm. I love that so much, and I'm always promoting your work and suggesting your work for lots of riders and um, horse people that I work with and I think one of the things I really love about it is that it can be applied by us you know we're not requiring necessarily someone to come in there are lots of things you can do as a lay person that will um, absolutely assist your horse and in many instances the, the kind of worst that can happen quote unquote is that you'll be ineffectual as opposed to actually causing harm yeah. like some of the more manual therapies that we might typically understand you can't really do it wrong you can always do it better i love that so so why do you think this works why do you think this the methodology that you're teaching and the way of going about things is so effective in releasing tension well i think it's because um and this is just i'm just guessing and i'm sitting outside is, if the wind is um if you can pick it up picking up the wind and the microphone, you know, it is it is quite windy i can hear okay let me go i'll go inside okay go i think the reason it works so well is because we're working with the horse's nervous system mm-hmm. and we're getting the horse to to release the tension it's not it's not so much that we're doing it we're not you know physically we're not manipulating muscles or or mechanically getting muscles to relax, where we're just bringing the horse's attention to somewhere where it's been holding tension mm-hmm. in a way it can't brace against it. And so the horse's nervous system releases the tension. So I think, you know, after years of doing this, and when I started, I didn't know how it worked any I, either. I was in the same boat as you are, or your question is that this is really working by following what the horse is telling me, telling me where it's holding tension and just allowing the horse's body to release it. It's really effective. So um, I think that's that's the reason it works so well. That's beautiful. So from my understanding, from my work is very much people focused and I'm dealing a lot obviously with pre-patterned um, anxiety, pre-patterned tension that's kind of holding in the system in different ways and in some instances yeah. trauma as well. And what I understand about that and that I've kind of like transferred to my horsing life is that, you know, if you actually take someone to the place where they're already activated, it's very difficult to bring back bring them back down to relaxation or allow for release because the nervous system has already gone into that um, flight place or freeze place or you know just general however it's responded to to the stimulus and so 
if my understanding of, of um, the Masterson method, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that we're, we're looking to actually hover below that resistance line so that you're, you're gently bringing awareness to areas of accumulated tension. And through that awareness, there's this release that spontaneously happens, but you're not actually taking them to a place where their nervous system might be triggered by something that would kind of uh, liberate those <laughs> natural responses. Yeah, I, I won't correct you because you're not wrong. So, <laughs> but, you know, it, you know, it's. I think it's similar with people, like you just said. So, I do clinics with Mark Rashid, and he's he uh, said something once that people, uh, you know, a lot of our problems with horses come from us. You know, mm-hmm. we're trying to deal with it on the level of the problem of the horse, or sometimes on our level. And he he said, you know, people live in a low level low level state of fear. And so there's a certain part of our nervous system, the sympathetic, that's always, you know, kind of bracing and, or uh, that's our defense mechanism. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's the same with horses that, uh, you know, in the wild, they, they, if they start to limp at the first sign of pain, then they become a target for the predator. So they're wired to just cover it up and block it out and keep on going. Mm-hmm. And so um, they're that, and I'm just, like I said, I'm not a scientist or a vet, but as I've done this long enough and I read about things like the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic, that the horse had, there's a certain level of the sympathetic, paras, uh, sympathetic nervous system that's active all the time to make sure that they don't show a sign of weakness and so that they're not picked out by the predator. So I think what we do is when we're doing, for example, the bladder meridian, we're doing that search really lightly, using no pressure at all because the horse can't brace against no, no pressure. Mm-hmm. And for, anywhere on the body, but we follow that bladder meridian line to start with for a response, a subtle change in behavior in the horse, such as a blink or a lip twitch, uh, then the horse is feeling something there. And, but we're not giving there any, them anything to brace against it. So if we stay there long enough, that the sympathetic, the survival part of the nervous system will start to let go and the parasympathetic will start to come into play and it will, and it will start to release the tension on its own. And when it does that, it'll, it'll, it'll give us other visual cues, you know, like looking and chewing or yawning or snorting or sneezing, signs that it's releasing uh, tension. Mm-hmm. It's kind of I've, similar to what you're saying with people. You know, you, if you attack the problem on the level of the problem, you're just, you're dealing with that level of resistance. And if you stay under that, then you allow, you give the horse's body a chance to start to let it go. Mm, mm, so beautiful. I've always been blown away how effective the bladder meridian technique is just every time, <laughs> mm-hmm. but for seemingly so little input from your end. Yeah, it, it, I'm blown away by it too. And I'm still not, I mean, I'm just kind of making that up. I don't know how it really works, but that's what makes sense to me. But it, it's just, it's so light and simple that that you almost think it's not going to work. But then when you see the results, you see the horses releasing. And then I, I get emails all the time about people that, that's where they start with the bladder meridian because they really don't want to start with any manipulations or movement techniques. So they start with that and they're just amazed that a horse will let go uh, really deep seated tension that it's mm-hmm. holding in a system uh, and it'll give these huge releases and some, some anyways, it's, it is uh, pretty amazing. It and is. it's not just saying that cause I invented it cause I didn't invent it. I just found it. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I've actually, I have um, some trainers that I'm following online and I'm friends with and, and in many instances now they're using your techniques as a precursor to any work that they do in the arena simply because what it does is ensure that the baseline that you're beginning from is one where that residual or latent tension is released in as much as possible um, for the context yeah. that they're in and then the the re, the level of reactivity that might typically present as a matter of course through interaction or you know lack of relaxation just doesn't come up because you've already lowered the notches prior to actually starting any kind of more energy yeah work. yeah the horse is starting on that level mm-hmm. uh, like like i said if you start with zero pressure on the horse the horse is going to start with zero you know? yeah yeah so, so if you can get the horse down to that level and and that's where you're starting it's going to be more effective. I don't know who are like, I met Warwick Schiller a couple of years ago in, in Australia or at the uh, Equitana. And then he, I think he's in California. He, we were talking about the same thing, you know, first mm, mm. that level. Yeah. It's fabulous. Even uh, we, we've had that discussions um, in my membership community <laughs> about the startle response and how um, some riders really struggle if their horse spooks or so on and so forth to kind of get themselves back 
from a place of reactivity when they're when they're kind of in that situation and we talk about the amount of tension you hold prior is um, directly proportional to the amount of reactivity you respond to something with and also how long it takes you to reset and I think mm. that would be kind of a translated something that we could transpose to the same situation do you think with our horses? Yeah. So if you're coming into a practice or you're coming in to do um, the work that you do with horses is there a way that you set yourself up like are you mindful of how you're holding your body and and breathing and intention like is that a part of your work also or the way that you well, do your work some somebody asked me that question recent question recently and i don't do anything that you know to to prepare for it other than just out of habit early on i learned that if you go into the stall and you're relaxed that the horse is relaxed and then i noticed sometimes i would be i would move i would walk towards the horse and i just kind of move my feet and the horse would, would not startle, but it would be a little bit more alert. And mm -hmm. it's picked up my foot and started walking towards the horse. So now, before I noticed when horses are standing around in a herd, if one just picks up its leg really quickly, to, then often the horses, the other ones will startle. But if it shifts it, its weight a little bit and then, then moves its foot, so I'll just stand relaxed. And then if I walk, when I walk towards the horse, I don't just walk, I shift my weight off of one leg and then move that leg and move the other. So it's kind of more of a, it's more of a body language thing, but, it, but that's it, you know, I, and I just start, and I, also, you can't have an agenda when you go and work on the horse. You, yeah. you can, but you're going to be starting at the level of your agenda, whereas if you have no agenda and you have no anticipation or, or something happening and you just do, let's start with the bladder meridian, do the bladder meridian, and you just, you just do the bladder meridian, you watch the horse, and your mind pretty well shuts down on its own because you're just tuning into what the horse might tell you that that kind of settles just doing the bladder meridian settles your mind so i don't do any preparation other than just out of habit going in with no agenda and just standing to eat breath and being like a horse that's standing there relaxed and then eventually that at least brings the horse down a little bit if it's mm -hmm. nervous I, I had an experience recently actually where i do the bladder meridian quite frequently um, with my horses and I took my young horse out to a clinic for the first time and he was, he was good, but he was a little bit up. And so, and I felt myself the same, like a little bit kind of up. Mm -hmm. And so we were standing on the edge of the arena and I started doing the bladder meridian with him. And for both of us, it was like a bi-directional relaxation mm -hmm. that happened. Like I felt both of us come back down. So by the time we went out there, we were in a much better kind of head and heart space to, to do what we um, wanted to do. So it was really cool. Yeah. Cause it brings you down just mm -hmm. automatically. You know, just by doing the bladder meridian, you really, you're, you're, you, you might start doing it thinking and worrying, am I doing it right or whatever, then pretty soon you get a blink. And so the pretty soon you, you're just paying attention to the blink and, and you've kind of let go of a lot of stuff. So it, it brings you both. Very cool. So, so let's talk about some of the responses that you look out for. So with the integrative or you, you talk about that you're doing it very much with the horse, not to the horse, which is kind of like a very distinct um, difference between some of the more manual bodywork um, practices that you might be familiar with. But when you're looking for um, a sign from the horse of, um, of, I don't know, awareness, I guess, is that what you would call it? Like awareness of something happening in the area that you're positioned in. What is it that you're looking for from them? What feedback are you looking for? Well, I'm look the first, the, the really subtle responses. So we'll use the bladder meridian again as an example. So use, use your you go start up at the pole, say you can start anywhere on the horse, but you know, you don't have to start at the beginning of a certain meridian line. But so we start just behind the earth pole and with really light touch of what I call air gap. And then, you know, you take a deep breath, just relax, and then you slowly come follow down the top line of the horse just up and you're watching for the most common subtle change of behavior is the blink. So if you come really lightly down, you see the horse's eye blink and the horse, if it's, it's feeling something under your hand that it's telling you that it's feeling something by blinking. But uh, the blink is, um, is just one response. So really any change in behavior that correlates with what you're doing is a response. So mm -hmm. let's say you come down and you get a blink. And so you think, well, was that caused by what I'm doing or was that just the horse blinking? Well, you can just test it by going back up and coming down again. And if you get a blink at the exact same spot, then, that, then there's a correlation between what you're doing and the horse is doing. So that's a, an example of how to find the subtle response. Now, some horses are not blinkers. They're, they'll move their lips. They'll twitch their lips. So uh, maybe because they're more uh, 
they're more on guard, you know, they're more careful. So they know you're looking at their eyes so they don't blink. So you might get the lips twitch or you might get, they just turn their head away. So it's some change in behavior that correlates with what you're doing. So all of those are subtle responses, the lips twitching, the eye, eye blinking, uh, maybe they just, their eye gets bigger or their ear moves or comes up. Just some sign that they're feeling something that they weren't feeling before because they've, they've been blocking it out in order to slow mm-hmm. So it's really any change in behavior that correlates with what you're doing. They might drop their head a few on inches or centimeters over there. Uh, centimeters, <laughs> they, but we can they talk. They might, <laughs> <laughs> they might drop their head a centimeter. They might drop their head 1.22 centimeters, which is half an inch, you know, and so that's a sign that something that they're that they're feeling something. So, mm-hmm. and does there tend to be a difference? That, Sorry, that, that helps because you you don't just have to worry about the blink. You can you start to pick up all kinds of things if you're just watching the horse and looking for any change in behavior. So. Yeah, yeah. So, is there a, a distinct difference in your experience between signs of awareness, or I suppose we could call them tension indicators? I'm not quite sure what right word to use, and signs of yeah. release. Yeah, so so those signs of release are larger signs. They're bit, they're larger, more obvious behavior. So, and they're just they're just. I mean, it's logical. They're just signs of relaxation. So you you go down, you find a blink or a subtle response, and you just stay there and do nothing, which is the hard part for humans. Mm-hmm. Stay there and do nothing. Yeah. Don't push on it. Don't rub it. Don't pet the horse. Just wait because you're keeping the horse's awareness on that spot in a way they can't brace against it so that then they'll start to release it. So you wait. And then when the horse starts to release tension, often they'll fidget just before they release tension. So they'll look away or they might move their feet or they might do something. But if you just stay with it that's a, and just stay there, the signs of release, they might, they might drop their head. They might lick and chew. Uh, they might relax one leg or the other and shift weight from leg to leg. Often they'll give you the larger response right away. Often they'll just start yawning right away if they're released and it depends you can start to pick up on the personality of the horse whether it's a very stoic and guarded horse or where it's a very uh trusting and expressive horse so so stoic horses you might get a half of a blink for a subtle response so you stay there and then when they release they lick and they lick once and so that's their release mm-hmm. whereas the horse might start yawning over and over again so the point is that every horse is is different in how they they show the signs of release or how they process all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And and with horses that you've worked with repetitively, so you, you might have kind of a relationship with or are familiar with in some way. Do you notice an increasing level of sensitivity to the work that you do over time? Most of the time they start to get, they start to get used to it and they start, they start to become, they become conditioned to release more easily. So Mm. the time you work on them once and then you come back, the next time and they'll, they'll release more easily. They'll be a little more trusting because mm-hmm. they, uh, I think it's not just that they, they feel better when you do it, but I think that that's, they start to trust you because you're responding to what they're telling you with their body language. So, you know, you're getting what they're telling you and not on an intellectual level because they don't really analyze things, but they get that when they do something with their body, subtle body language, you change what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And so the trust that you're you're paying attention to them. Yeah. So normally they they release much more easily. But you know there are some horses that are just either naturally or like inherently, or they're they're conditioned to be just on guard all the time. So Mustang off the range, you know, and it's been it's been through a lot. It might have been in a pen for months or even years, still wild, and then you get it, and it's going to take a long time for that horse to. To really trust so you with that horse you may not get that every time you go to the horse it might be like starting all over again mm-hmm. or a horse that that's just the way it is could you talk us through the levels of touch that you're referring to because there's quite a number of different places you can take it and sort of like levels yeah. of pressure you can apply so so uh different levels of pressure uh when i started teaching it or you know i would be working on a horse and somebody say well what level of pressure are you doing because some of the techniques we use no pressure, like the bladder meridian, we use what I call air gap, which is just barely touching the hair. Mm-hmm. And then other techniques, uh, you start with more pressure. And, and so the next level of pressure, when somebody asks how much pressure are you using, rather than say 2.4 centimeters per square, oh, two point, no, I'm sorry, I was mixing uh, 
distance with weight. Okay, let's do it in, in American. 2.4 square inches over a three square inch area for a period of 23 seconds. And I said, well, that's, that's about egg yolk. It's about the amount of pressure it would take to you know, push on an egg yolk without, without breaking it. So I start with air gap, and then the next level is egg yolk, and then the next level is grape, the amount of pressure it takes to squeeze a grape without breaking it. The next level is lemon, and then the, hard, the highest level is lime hard line, which is about as much pressure as you can put on. Mm-hmm. So they all ended up having to do with food. So yeah. <laughs> you can tell me what that means. You're the It's a global <laughs> language. <laughs> a global language. I like that. Yeah, so, definitely. so anyway, so you start a technique with a certain level of pressure and that's just your starting point. So, cause you're just asking the horse something, you know, when you're doing that, when you're doing a technique, you're asking it where it's uncomfortable and when it starts to brace. So you'll start the bladder meridian with air gap, and then you'll start uh, the lateral flexion, lateral cervical flexion on the neck. You'll start that with egg yolk or grape. And then there are some techniques where you're going to gradually build up to line. But you're, the, the key is you're always staying underneath the horse's bracing response, their mm-hmm. internal or external bracing response. So mm-hmm. if you find that the horse is it's not working or the horse is physically bracing, you always go back down a notch you don't go more so you'll always start with a certain level of pressure and if it's if it's not working or if the horse starts to brace against it you soften and with the movement techniques where you're using a little more pressure that's how the horse tells you where there's some there's tension in the body as you're going down the neck you're gently wiggling your way down the vertebra of the neck using egg yolk or grape and if you hit a an area of the neck where the horse has physical tension or discomfort it's going to tense its neck Mm -hmm. and you're going to in both hands and when you soften the horse releases some of that tension and then you move through it i was a little more than your aunt than the simple answer today i love it I lo- i'm not one for small talk jim so you're totally speaking okay. my language it's fine <laughs> um i i had an experience actually with the cervical um flexion exercise which might be a good one to discuss because i imagine this is something that a lot of people um, have questions about which is mm-hmm. i i was out there in the arena and i'm doing it in a relatively um open space I've got sort of a 20 by 40 meter arena so I don't have a, a stable that I can do it yeah. and I noticed to one side it was all very matter of fact and and um, fairly by the book and then on the in the other direction he had quite a strong reaction to what it is that I was doing and I aimed to stay really soft and not apply more pressure but he was moving his body quite a lot so mm-hmm. if that a signal to me to take it down or should, if I'm able to stay with him and not exert more force, quote unquote, do I go with the movement that he's presenting in that time? Yeah. So did he start to walk or did he pull his yeah, head Yeah, he away? was backing up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so you're, you have your one hand on the nose and you're going down mm-hmm. and then the other on the neck and you're gently wiggling and then you yeah. soft and you go move your hand down. And when you hit a spot where he's uncomfortable, then he's going to be uncomfortable. So he's going to, yeah either want to pull his head away or he's going to walk or back up like you yeah. said. I was so, surprised at the level of his reaction, actually. I didn't. Compared to the other side, because you would never know, right? Mm. That, that side was more, had more tension unless you could ask. So mm-hmm. that's how they are covering it up. So, so when he starts to back, you just soften both hands and arms and stay with him. Mm-hmm. And, with him. and when, he, when he stops backing, then you ask again. So, so when he started to back, if you soften both hands and arms, if you completely soften both hands and arms without letting them go, he'll stop backing 90, 90% of the time. Mm-hmm. So he's, if he keeps backing up, it's because you're, you haven't softened enough. So he's, yeah. he's telling you. you know. Yeah, yeah. So I, I love so, the amount of awareness it brings in. It's a really, it's such a cool process. I learn so much from it every time. Yeah, you get better and better and better all the time. You can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And even it's, it's interesting, I find that, you when you're constantly checking in with yourself and making sure that you're not holding tension in your body how you're like oh actually i've like tensed my shoulders a little bit or i'm i'm holding yeah. my elbows quite tightly like it's a constant check-in process yeah you check in because i have to do the same thing if i'm working on a horse and the horse starts to fuss i have to consciously say am i am i softened you know am i really softened yeah and if the horse keeps fussing i know i i might say yeah i'm softened if the horse is still fussing, 90% of the time it's because I haven't really softened all the, all the way. 
Yeah, I've got a, a, sli- a question that's a slight tangent, um, and it's been something that I've playing, I've been playing with. But do you think that it's possible um, when we are feeling tension under our hands? So you know, you get a certain quality of feel in response to bringing the, the nose slightly towards you, and you can you, mm. you immediately pick up patterns of brace in your own body um, in response to what the horse is offering. Do you think that by releasing the patterns at your end, you feed back relaxation in response to the tension that's being fed down your arm or in communication with whatever it is that you're, you're kind of. Oh yeah, I would think, I would think so. Yeah. 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 So it's sort of like this, but I've been calling it bi-directional relaxation that basically you can use how it is you feel in your own body to pick up tensions that are being offered to you. And if you're able to check in with those and release them, you kind of feedback in a way that doesn't offer the same quality of tension. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the horse is giving you the feedback. Mm-hmm. You have to be so present for it, which is, I think, why everything just feels so amazing at the end of it, because you just can't go to another place and be thinking about dinner or the problems in life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, well, in, in, uh, it's being used more in um, equine assistive therapies. Mm-hmm. Because you do have to really be conscious and tune in and and be self aware. So I love it, that you do have to it, you do have to check in with yourself. Right? I mean, even on the most basic level, if you're tense, the horse is tense. So yeah. So I had a question that came up recently when I recommended someone do um, your practices at the start, where and I think this is a relatively common situation. Their horse oscillates between being relatively shut down where they're requiring quite a lot of energy to motivate them to do anything. And they might be perceived as lazy in a sense, but then all of a sudden you have a kite on the end of the line where they're actually hyper reactive to what's going on and there's no middle ground in between. And to me, I I suggested doing your work because that sort of disembodiment or that dysregulation in the nervous system indicates this holding of tension on kind Mm -hmm. of a deeper level. Do you have any thoughts to add to that? What comes to to mind for me when you describe that's the same horse, right? You can't. Yeah, get the same horse. This kind of like. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that's his. That's his way. That's his kind of defense mechanism. He's protecting something. So, you know, you have a horse that just doesn't want to move. That's different than a horse that doesn't want to move. And then you keep applying pressure to the point where it goes to the other end of the spectrum. It's because it's it's you uh, pushed it beyond what it can brace against. Now it's going to use another. Do some it's going to flee you know you, they 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 brace so and freeze so to me there's something going on with that horse there's something and and i don't it could be uh mental or, or emotional but uh, you know in my experience when you have horses like that there's something physical that's going on and it feels compromised and it, and it knows it's compromised and so it just blocks it out by doing nothing and when it reaches that point where it where you that doesn't work anymore then it goes completely to the other end of the spectrum because then it flees because it's something going on physically with the horse and that a lot of times when there's a mental or emotional thing with the horse there's a physical side to that too that, that, mm-hmm. uh, you have to deal with if you want to really get to the solution. it's all so interdependent isn't it like regardless of the, the point of origin there's always going to be a a discharge of the energy in one direction. If it's mental and emotional, it's going to be held in the body as well. So mm-hmm. sometimes that's the best point of access, actually. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. unless a horse has really been, you know, uh, in a lot of fear and, and you know, not maybe not physically abused, but usually horses has a lot of fear because of some past experience that you have horses like that, but more often I think you have horses that are both. And they don't have a whole world. This is, again, just my world according to Jim. They don't have a whole emotional drama world that we have. They don't invent stuff, you know. We invent stuff and we hang on to it and we create stories around it. Horses don't do that. They either had the experience or or they or they didn't or they have the physical issue or they don't. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Usually yeah, I think there's a physical issue unless they've really been really been emotionally abused or you know, fear, fear based. No, it makes a lot of sense. Do you, do you have a favorite story? Have you seen a horse kind of make an evolution out of a, a, a very compromised place um, as a result of what you do? Well, I, I've worked on a lot of horses that have, have changed a lot, but I, um, I probably had more people email that have had experience with their horses than just the Vladimir. 
Mm-hmm. And they said it's a changed horse. So when I work on a horse or I have in the past and I get, you know, uh, I hear back from the owner that, oh, the horse is like a changed horse. I tried not to let it go to my head. And I, I just kind of, oh, okay, well, that's good. You know? <laughs> Send me another check, you know? I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I probably have gotten lots more um, uh, communications with people that are than the Vladimir Meridian that have gotten the changes in the horses. Mm-hmm. But there are, you know, there are a few that come to mind for me. You know, when I used to work on hunter jumpers, I worked on lots of horses. So, you know, I don't remember a lot of specific ones, maybe one or two. But um, there's a horse recently, I think two or three years ago, that I worked on in in California at one of the crashing clinics that we do together. And the the it's the horse's name is Whisper, and I think on our we have him on her on the YouTube video. But the owner, she did um, she was a jumper, I think. And she, the horse was progressively getting worse and worse and worse over the last three or four years. And she didn't know what was wrong. At first, she thought it was a training issue. And then, but it, she just couldn't train it out of the horse. And she'd been to lots of trainers. And we evaluate the horse. We watch the horse go, Mark and I, together. And we thought, we're thinking, you know, what be this and what might be that. And it's just kind of observing what's going on. And then we work on the horse. And then the rider comes back for a lesson the next day with the horse. So we can see if there were any physical issues going on. And this horse, when I worked on her, the um, when a horse has had a fall or been in an accident or tumbled or even just fallen over on its side, a lot of times it'll just jar their nervous system. You know, by a car, you know, maybe, you know, our nervous system is jarred if we're in our car. Mm-hmm. And they have this feel. After a while, their whole body just tightens up. And at the time of the of the incident, they look fine. Like they'll get up and trot off sound. They look fine. And so you think they're fine, but they're, it hasn't set in yet. And so they get this feel where their whole trunk is just kind of locked up. And so this horse, Whisper, had that feel. And so I, I worked on her and I did, you know, a, a, this technique that that it's, um, uses, you know, quite a bit of force, but you have to keep under the horse's tracing response to get her to let go. And then she started wobbling on her feet. Like she really let go. And so that was the most recent and the one that really stuck for me. And she almost, her knees were buckling afterwards. I was just doing this little roll knee before it was over. And, and I asked the owner, she feels like she's been in an accident or had a fall or something. And I was like, no, I, I, she hasn't, I don't remember this happening. And then she emailed me a couple of days later and said, oh, I remember the horse. She had fallen into a ditch and we had to pull her out. And so but she was fine after that. And I said, well, that sounds like it. Uh, I've heard the story a lot. And uh, since then, she's, she's gotten better and better and better. She's able to work with the horse now. So that, I, I like that story because I actually have a video, you know, <laughs> shows the, the, the body work on her. Mm. And I don't like to tell stories about, oh, yeah, I had this horse that, that, that couldn't, couldn't walk. And then I worked on it. And in 10 minutes, it was jumping. Yeah. Out. You know, because you hear that all the time. So I try to stay away from that. But this one, you can see Whisper almost collapsing from the body. Wow, that's amazing. So amazing. Um, do you think that, you know, like in terms of um, trauma responses that we hear about in the wild or natural responses to the arousal cycle in the nervous system, where like a prey animal is being chased and then um, mm-hmm. they, you know, obviously the sympathetic nervous system is activated. And then yeah. if, they, if they manage to escape, there's a process that they go through of kind of shaking and discharge and, and yeah. things which allow their nervous systems to naturally reset. Do you, do you mm-hmm. think, and this is just what's popped into my head, so it could, I could be completely off the mark, which I'm totally open to. And that happens all <laughs> well, we're time. having a conversation. <laughs> exactly. Do you think that when there's that, when there's that kind of uh, stuck point in the nervous system, like something's happened like a fall and mm-hmm. the, that the energy of the moment hasn't been processed properly. So they kind of get up and they look fine, but obviously there's a kind of a glitch if you like, mm-hmm. if you want to talk about it that way. Do, do you yeah. find that in, in the release point, like with the buckling of the knees, and again, this is just, the, again, the world according to Jane, so you can feel free yeah. to answer in the world according to Jim. Do you think okay. they kind of go back to a point where of that stuck place physically and the release kind of mimics the situation that they were initially in when it occurred, or is that a little bit too woo-woo? Well, I don't know. Uh, so the, the release... Um 
release responses you mean the behaviors yeah so if she was in a ditch and kind of fell into the ditch and then the way that she's releasing is like the buckling of the knees and kind of almost going back into a collapse um yeah well the way the what would have happened at the time potentially i i i think it could you know and we're just kind of guessing here but you know it, it well could be that yeah i find it fascinating I think horses they're you know just me again i think they're very they're they're very they're complex but they're simple at the same time like you know there's the something happens and it has an effect on them and it's real and then the the res, the consequence is real i mean they don't have a lot of drama around stuff so you just if you see something in the horse that um if they're feeling something and they, they're going to tell you when you find it mm-hmm. and they're express it they're not going to they're not going to try to they're not going to be worried that you're going to think there's something, you know, there's totally. not this whole magical thing going on. With them. It's just yeah. this perfect connection. And there's also that intuited communication where you're in that moment with them feeling the quality of whatever it is that you're feeling. And in response to that, it's like, it seems sort of obvious on some level that there's been an accident, even if the feedback to you is yeah. in the moment, no, we can't remember it. Like it's that, that's a very pure sort of intuitive. Yeah, there's connection. something there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They haven't made up a story about it. No. And either of you, you know, like I think that, that as humans, sometimes you can pick things up in that way or sort of have an, have a hunch about something. That's what some people might say. And then you override it because you doubt your own um, yeah. intuition or feeling right. about you doubt your own intuition. Situation. Yeah, yeah. You might get other feedback or you might have other, you know, things that have been said in the past about intuition. But one cool thing about this that I noticed and uh, is that when you um, really, when you're doing, I'm going to use the bladder meridian or any technique that you're doing, you're really tuning into the horse. And I don't mean uh, deliberately and trying to tune in, but you're just watching the horse. And as the horse responds, you start to, you start to pay attention. So you're, 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 uh, analytical mind starts to shut down mm. when you and so when your analytical mind starts, starts to shut down your intuition starts to kick in and i was never a big intuition person before working on horses you know and i knew people had intuition and they could pick up on stuff and i didn't doubt it but i just didn't have it but when i after working on horses doing this pretty soon your mind quiets down and you're just watching the horse and pretty soon something just pops into your head and so you do it you know, some technique, you just do it. Or you go to a part of the horse's back where you you just go there with your hand and there's something there. So you find something there. So your intuition starts to kick in when, you're, when your mind settles down. It just happens automatically. You can't help not do it now. <laughs> I'll try to not do yeah, it. well, it's, a, it's as natural as any other response. It's just not the one that we're, we're taught to pay no, the most attention to. Because mm-hmm. yeah. we get a lot of feed, we get a lot of, in our lives, we get a lot of feedback and stuff and opinions and stuff like that. The horse doesn't have an opinion. Yeah, I, um, I, I did a video recently on the second arrow, which is the second arrow is the thought that comes after the real thought, which is like, oh, I feel like I need to go to this place. And then the second arrow is don't be so stupid. Like that's where are you getting that information from? Like, and we have that whole conversation layering on top of what feels right and real that kind of stops us sometimes playing or trusting ourselves. So mm-hmm. I can talk about this all day. <laughs> 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 it's very cool so as a as a standard kind of wellness Wait, I, oh the second arrow is the doubt right yeah the second arrow is the doubt or um the 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 other um phrase that i call it is the itty bitty shitty committee like the committee that pipes up the kind of <laughs> yeah. critic that's like whatever yeah. like that's ridiculous and um, yeah and just as a rule, like if you think about our culture and the way that our school system is set up, it really values analytical, logical, quote unquote, thought. And so you're you're not taught to kind of honor that voice. It's like, well, where's the facts? Where's the proof? Where's the sighting? Yeah. Where's the reference? Let's stop. Let's stop. Let's stop and think about this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you kind of disembody yourself to get to an answer rather than thinking about what it, what is naturally emanating from within. You kind of look from without, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't, and, and uh, like, just like this body work, life's an experiment. So you get, you get an impulse. So why not, why not go there? And if yeah. it doesn't work, then yeah. go back and figure it out if you want to, or just go take the next impulse. Exactly. I, I was having a, a conversation um, on this kind of level with my friend, Kerry Lake, and she said, 
um, you know, what, what good does it ever do to doubt yourself? And that's always, um, I've always kind of taken that quote with me in, in this sort of framework where I'm like, if I get that seed of doubt, I'm like, what good does it do to doubt myself? Why not just be curious about where this is taking me and, and how it shows up? Mm, yeah. So the, we've talked a lot about the bladder meridian um, already. And to my mind at the moment in the kind of world uh, pandemic that we're finding ourselves in where a lot of us perhaps aren't no in normal horsing circumstances, we're either just working with them on the ground or perhaps some people are choosing not to ride. Is there something that we could offer people or that you could offer people in terms of a start point if they haven't already been working with this process and I'm happy to link in any videos that you have on YouTube um, to help. Yeah, I, I, well, we have, we have lots of YouTube videos on different techniques to do, but the easiest and the, and the most, the best place to start it, of course, is the bladder meridian. We have a DVD called uh, Light to the Core and it's um, work on three different horses. It's not just doing the bladder meridian, it's doing very light work similar to that but paying, paying attention to the horse's whole body, not just doing it, you know, the bladder meridian different spots. Mm -hmm. But we put together a 17 minute video on the bladder meridian off of, we took it up and, you know, edited it out of the that we have on, on YouTube for free. And it's, it's pretty, you know, extensive. On, and I think I do it on two or three different horses on how to do the bladder meridian and what to look for. So it's not just a quick video, it's like 17 minutes. And um, on our website, it's called the light to the core bladder meridian video. And I think I could probably give you a link for awesome. uh, your listeners. It's a related start to it. And it's free. <laughs> Yay. I also saw. Yeah, the, another part of this, the whole thing, is that a lot of people aren't working right now. So that they could, uh, they appreciate something that they don't have to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really and cool. it's, um, but to another aside, though, your books and courses and um, DVDs are totally worth the investment. So I'm going to like plug that in there as well. But if you're on the fence about that, I have the, the library of information on my bookshelf next to me and it's definitely oh, good. worth it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we get like we don't like 99 percent like, positive feedback, that, you know, from our, our seminars and courses. So, and you know, I just, there's always that one person out of the hundred that that need, wants something different or more. But you know, yeah. the feedback we get is all positive. You know, that's it's, really it's cool. Not just, I mean, it's all of our instructors are really passionate about this, and and our practitioners out there too. You know, masters and method practitioners, when they come to work on your horse, they don't just work on your horse; they they teach you how to work on your horse. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a uh, it's a psychological disorder we all have. You know, we can't just do it. We got to teach it. We got to share. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> an affliction. <laughs> affliction. Yeah. I I so appreciate that because I live in an area where it's difficult to get uh, people. You know, like we're quite isolated where we are, so it's not a luxury that I have to kind but of. Yeah, yeah, you're in New Zealand, right? Yeah, yeah, and then it, yeah, that, that that's isolated. Problem. The whole yeah. the whole country is isolated. It, I guess it just depends where you're looking. Yeah, from like you. they didn't have the, the whole world. Like they, oh, where are we going to put New Zealand? We, we don't have any room. Let's put it way down here. Well, I guess that that's because the view that you're looking from is down, whereas we're looking up and going, what are uh, they okay. doing all the way up there? <laughs> yeah, what are they doing? <laughs> when are they going to come to their senses? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, so just as a kind of uh, standard wellness practice, um, perhaps we've already covered it, like the bladder meridian is like a good one to do just as a, a check-in point and also just to promote overall health and well-being if you don't have a specific thing that you're looking to focus on yeah, yeah. well that might that opens the door, the door to uh, your horse is going to tell you where it's holding tension like you said on your horse you had no idea that one side of the neck was was uh had more stuff going on than the other so as you do the bladder meridian and you pay attention you start to know oh he's showing me more responses and releases here or, or when you get down to the hock, often if a horse has a sore hock, you may not even be aware of it. But as you go down over the hind leg and you get to the hock and the horse picks its hind leg up and says, you know, don't do that. So he just told you he's been covering it up really well, but yeah, you found it. So you start, it starts to open the door to lead you to, okay, I need to do something here and I need to do, spend more time here on this area. And, um, you start to learn about what's going on with your horse. And from there, that motivates you to maybe learn some techniques that might help you with that. Yes. But the whole horse is interconnected. You don't just work on the problem. You, if a horse has, uh, let's say the horse has pain retention in the, in the lower back or in the sacral lumbar area, 
you you want to release that, but you do it by working on the whole horse. Mm-hmm. You don't work on that area. Mm-hmm. So because yeah. it's all interconnected, you know, the, why is that area sore? That area might be sore because there's something going on in the, uh, I, I don't know, maybe something on the right or left behind, you know, hawk or stifle, mm-hmm. or, or it might be because the horse has sore front feet and he's taking trying to stay off of both front feet, so he has to shift his weight behind. And so it just kind of opens, you, if you're open to looking at what's going on and following it, then uh, it's a little more dynamic than just, oh, he's for your head. Fabulous. So if um, no doubt the, the people that aren't familiar with your work yet will be wanting to know where to find you, um, where are the places that they can find you online to seek um, seek out more more um, um, Masterson and method yeah masterson method.com is our website and okay. and we have uh well for, first of all we have 20 or 30 youtube clips on how to do different techniques so mm-hmm. that you don't have to people you just go on my my philosophy is if, if you put it out there and share it and people try it if they want to learn more they're going to come back to learn more you start there but the place to start is the beyond a horse massage book and then we have beyond horse massage dvd they're meant to go together, but you can buy one or the other or buy them together. The DVD shows you how to do the, t- I demonstrate how to do the techniques and explain it, explain them, but the book goes a little more into the biomechanics, like what's that area, releasing tension in that area, the effects that might happen worse, or, and it goes into the details, like, like I can demonstrate how to do the lateral foot cervical flexion, but mm-hmm. what if the horse starts to throw his head? Well, the book goes into the what ifs. And then we have, um, to the core DVD, which is all very light work, and it's interesting because the lighter you go, the deeper the releases. So it's mm. kind of it's kind of backwards. Uh, you can release like the the lumbar area. You can start, You can massage the lower back and get the muscles of the lower back to relax by doing actual massage. But if you stay light on, if the horse is giving you responses in the lower back, and you stay light enough long enough, they'll start to release tension in the the psoas muscles under the lumbar spine. So it, it's kind of weird. It goes, the later you go, the deeper. Anyways, I'm getting off the, the, no, the great. question. So on our website, we have the book and DVD, Beyond Horse Massage. We have the Light to the Core video. We have Massage Movements Revealed DVD. We painted the horse with the muscles and had a, the horse go through the upper level dressage move, move, movements, and we videotape it in slow motion. We talk about some basic biomechanics and some of the basic muscles that are being used, and then we painted the skeleton on the horse and had him go through the massage movements and we did it in slow motion and we talk about um, how the body's moving. The idea being that, because when I started working on dressage horses over here anyways, a lot of people want to get up the levels really fast and I found so many really sore dressage horses and I just wanted to bring some awareness to dressage riders that there is an animal under them that at least you start with what's going on. So and then there's a book to go with that dressage horse optimized if you want to get into that. Basic starting places beyond horse massage. Or Beautiful. Beautiful. I'll, I'll link to all of those as well so people can find them. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm almost thinking actually that maybe we could do a um, like a seven-day bladder meridian challenge where everyone can get out there and sort of share their videos and, and go through that. Oh, yeah. For a week. That would be video, really cool. Set up your phone on, on a cat or a camera or something. Just do it and forget about the camera and just do the ladder reading and see what happens. Yeah. Some things happen. Yeah, I will do if that you, and I will invite everyone else to do it. We have weekend seminar uh, clinics in New Zealand. We have two instructors in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. We have eight practitioners in New Zealand. Very cool. We've got so a we huge had, um, amount of people in the States and Australia and um, we're all over the place listening. So, um, oh, okay. Yeah. Is there so, a- so, uh, it's all on the website. We have a, where our courses are. We have course calendar. Of course, we've had to uh, postpone a lot of the courses, and we just have to wait to see what happens. But mm-hmm. All of the courses are gonna are gonna happen. It's just that we're gonna have to move them. Yeah. But we do them over. We we have an instructor in Australia in Victoria, and we have the two instructors in New Zealand. We have, um, uh, I think we have probably 15 instructors in the States and another five in Europe and England. And I go to, I go to New Zealand. Um, well, you're in New Zealand, right? But you I have am, to- yeah. Yeah, I'm on the South Island. I think your instructors are on the North Island. Maybe I'll have to do the course myself. <laughs> well, you should, yeah. Well, let, one more, yeah. Uh, you keep in touch with me because I'll, uh, you should just do the course. I mean, I I'll, would love that. It's I'll been on my hit list the, for ages. I'll send you to the course, so. Yes. Um, yeah. 
be so cool. So, seminars for they're for horse owners, and we all the techniques in the Beyond Horse Massage and a few others we we teach in the weekend, and then we have a five day advanced course mm -hmm. um, for people that want to go further, and then we have a certification program that takes about a year year and a half of people that want to become certified. To, yeah, and other yeah. people's system. Very cool. So, well, I think anyone out there who hasn't done the bladder meridian or has and who loves it like I do, if they post their videos and make the settings public, they can tag both of us in and we can um, yes. check out uh -huh. the magic. That yeah, would be really we have cool. a Master Master's Method Facebook page and I have a Gym Master's one, but post them. And um, so my personal goal is to have uh, every horse on the planet have the bladder meridian done on it at least once. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's honestly just the best thing. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of addicted to, um, I'm, I'm the opposite of being addicted to adrenaline. I get so much out of seeing the yawns and the releases. It's like the best thing ever. <laughs> oh yeah, it is. Amazing. It's like the gold medal podium. When you see them release, you're like, yes, bladder meridian for the win. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's amazing. You never get tired of it. Really, no, no, not at all. Thank you so much, Jim. I really, really appreciate your time because I know it's precious. Well, right now we have like extra time, so we do. we're lounging in time. <laughs> I'm happy to do it anyway. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, I really it appreciate it. No, thank this you. is a really good interview. I'm, you ask really good questions, and it's from a little bit of a different angle, so it's kind of refreshing. Yay! Thank you. Well, we can we'll do it again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Have a fabulous rest of your day. Okay, team, so we've thrown the gauntlet down. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to watch the video of the Bladder Meridian Method that Jim mentioned. You can find that either on the Masterson Method YouTube channel, and I'll also post it in the show notes for you, and give that a shot this week. We would love to see your videos, so if you post them online, be sure to tag both of us in. I'm at The Confident Rider on Facebook. Jim is The Masterson Method Integrated Equine Performance Bodywork, or at Masterson Method on Instagram, and I'm at Confident underscore Rider. If you aren't able to be with your horse right now, I have seen a video of Jim doing this on other animals. So you can sh share it with your cat or your dog or even try it on your favorite human. <laughs> to learn more about Jim and his amazing work and check out the products on offer, you can visit his website, mastersonmethod.com. And of course, if it's me you're after, you can find me at confidentrider.online or on any of those social media links I mentioned. Have a wonderful day and I'll catch you on the flip side. <laughs>